2018 in Taipei Medical University, Taiwan. He has received various research. He has received various research grants, and he has research expertise in synthesis of small molecule inhibitors, organic transformation, and multi-component reaction. He is the reviewer of the various reputed international and national journals. in medicinal research review bio organic and medicinal chemistry british journal of pharmacology european journal of medicinal chemistry and bio organic chemistry he is the editorial board member of the mini review in the medicinal chemistry bentham science publisher and he is the various publications of the various international and national Hello. journals welcome you sir thank you so much thank you so much for such a nice introduction thank you so, so much i request so, you to address the participants so first of all you know it's always an honor to be associated with guru govind singh college of pharmacy in any of the context and i feel you know this platform gives me a chance to connect with so many professionals of the field and i feel very enlightened very excited very excited to be connected on such a platform and i have been delivering lectures for gd scop previously also and this time i was told that it is like a faculty development program so i need to particularly present the way we are researching means the methodology which we follow the protocol which we follow for our research endeavors so what i have done is i'll be presenting my research today what we have been doing for the last 5 years or a half a decade or 7 8 years and but i'll be telling you that how we actually conceive the idea and how we make sure that that idea gets transformed into into a product so i will be discussing from a very very practical point of view on the whole i am talking about rational drug design and <clears throat> yeah so i'll be discussing about rational drug design from a perspective of a medicinal chemist well medicinal chemistry you know and we i hope all the pharmacy professionals are connected with us at the moment so just to discuss with everyone that medicinal chemistry or pharmaceutical chemistry is an applied science where we are looking to synthesize bioactive molecules you know for that what we need to do is we need to select some lead compounds we need to go for the embellishment of structures as a chemist it is always challenging for everyone to synthesize to report new scaffolds well that's a very very good field where the chemist is just working in the area of chemistry and looking for some new heterocycles and then followed by their biological activity but from a perspective of a medicinal chemist i would say that sometimes it takes a lot of time if you start from scratch it surely takes a lot of time and when you want the drug discovery to happen in an expedited way then you don't need to start from scratch that means we need to make sure that we capitalize on the existing information existing information existing literature about the bioactive compounds and by capitalizing on the available information we don't need to start from scratch but we are always at the midway and then using that information we have to develop something that is very very beneficial very very useful for the mankind so what i'm going to tell you is that it is not always important or imperative or recommended to start from scratch of course if someone can report a scaffold for the first time then then they deserve huge accolades but if we have an idea about the lead structure and we just proceed towards the structure embellishment of the lead structure then obviously drug discovery can happen in a very very expedited way this i am going to talk about today so i have taken some examples of hdac inhibitors to explain to present my point of view that what i am i am working on and how we are looking forward in this direction for the design of anti cancer compound so as far as rational drug design is concerned i'll be talking about the rational drug design of anti cancer compounds and the target that i have chosen just for the explanation is hdac so if someone is actually interested in drug discovery you know we all know it is in the textbook that we need to be very very sure about the target 
Now, for the target, we need to be updated with the literature. You know, suppose I'm taking an example of HDAC inhibitors. So that means I'm very sure that HDAC is a very prudent target for the design of anti-cancer compounds. So one has to be very sure about the target. And then once you're sure about the target, then we move towards the designing of compounds. So there are two ways how we can design drugs. One is use a structural template. By using a structural template, I mean to say, suppose there are some very well-established targets for the design of anti-cancer compounds. Tubulin is one, heat shock protein is one, HDAC is one, topoisomerase is one, kinase is extensively reported to be very promising therapeutic targets for the design of anti-cancer compounds. Now to design a drug in an expedited way, what we can do is we can make use of an existing structural template. Now, what do we mean by existing structural template? You know, suppose tubulin, which is a very, very well established model, thousand and thousand of compounds are reported. You know, if you see any journal, they are flooded with so many papers just on tubulin inhibitors. That means the design is very clear in the head of the medicinal chemist. The design strategy for the accomplishment, for the furnishment, for the embellishment of tubulin inhibitors. It's very, very clear in the mind of the medicinal chemist. And sticking to that template, what we do is we just make some alterations and then proceed towards the biological evaluation. So this is an easy way to move towards a rational drug design strategy for the anti-cancer compound, structural template. As far as HDAC inhibitor concerned, HDAC, for the unversed, I just like to give them an overview that HDAC is basically an enzyme which has many isoforms and those isoforms have been uh, classified into various categories. And those isoforms have been found to be overexpressed in various malignancies. Suppose some of the isoform of HDAC, it has been found to be overexpressed in breast cancer, some have been found to be overexpressed in brain tumor, in lung cancer. So that is very sure that HDAC is an enzyme that has been found to be overexpressed and that makes it a very prudent target. Now, if you go by the literature and you see the structural template of HDAC inhibitors, you will be very clear that they are formed by a combination of three components. One is a cap construct, then a linker, then a zinc binding motif. So that means there is a very, very journalized view. There is a very, very journalized view for an HDAC inhibitor if you are looking to design a new one. You know, there is a set pathway. Okay, you need to stick to a general model. You call it a general model. You call it a pharmacophoric model. You stick to that. And just sticking to that, you can design new compounds, making some alterations in the template. So one of the ways is this, where you can, you know, first try to generalize things. Generalize a structural template. Okay, these thousand HDAC inhibitors, they have some common things. You know, they have a linker, they have this part, they have this part. Okay, if I need to design an HDAC inhibitor, I need to stick to this model. If we talk about tubulin inhibitor, okay, they have a structural template. So it becomes very easy if you can generalize things. One is this, using a structural template. Other is, I'm talking about rational drug design in a very, very expedited way, you know, if we want to design drugs, like, because, you know, the stage is, the process is very lengthy. You know, when we work in the laboratory, we design inhibitors, that is called the preliminary work. And once those preliminary compounds, they show good activity, they move towards the detailed preclinical activity and then towards the clinical activity and towards the, then further towards the approvals. So now what we are talking about is the preliminary stage and we want to expedite the things in this phase so that we can have more and more molecules in the preclinical stage that can further advance into clinical stage. So I told you one way is the use of a structural template and the other way is just look for a compound. You know, there are many compounds that show good activity, good enzymatic activity, good cellular activity, but unfortunately, Due to some reasons, some pharmacokinetic issues or some in vivo related issues, some issues, they are unable to advance into detailed investigational stage. So what is the next second way of uh, expediting the drug design uh, endeavors is take an inhibitor that has shown very good activity, but 
has been unable to proceed towards the preclinical studies or has been unable to get translated from the preclinical to the clinical study and just work on those shortcomings. So what we are going to do is we are going to discuss about these two strategies, how to make use of a structural template and how to make sure that an inhibitor that has been reported to be very promising, how that can be utilized or leveraged to the full extent. That means how to reduce the shortcomings and amplify its bioactivities or its strong points. So I am just I just told you that we will be talking about HDX. I will not consume much of the time discussing what, what HDX do, but I'll just tell you that it is an enzyme which has been found to be overexpressed in number of malignancies. So it becomes a very, very prudent target. So that's why we have been working on HDX extensively, I would say exhaustively. So if someone wants to work and someone is a new medicinal chemist or a pharmaceutical chemist or a pharmacologist, they can choose this target because you know designing drugs is relatively easier for this target. And the reason for that is the structural template for HDX inhibitors is a very, very well established one. So we are going to talk about rational drug design in context of HDEC inhibitors. Now, I just told you HDEC, it is an enzyme overexpressed in various malignancies and this enzyme has various isoforms. So first of all, if you look, if you want to work in the area of drug design, you need to be very sure which isoform is required to be targeted. Like HDEC enzyme has several isoforms and they have been divided into various categories. And the class one HDACs, which include the HDAC1 isoform, HDAC2 isoform, 3 isoform, and 8 isoform, they are reported to be uh, involved in gastric cancer, in the progression of gastric cancer, in the progression of breast cancer, and many other malignancies. So one is we should be very sure that this, which isoform of the enzyme needs to be targeted. If we are very sure, then we can move towards the drug design. Like, in this study, this is a study by our research group. And in this study, we were basically working for the design of new breast, anti-breast cancer compounds and anti-gastric cancer compounds. And we were very sure that class 1 HDAX, the histone deacetylases, class 1, they were overexpressed in breast cancer and gastric cancer. So we thought, let us fix this target. You know, first it is the target, and then it is only followed by the design of the compounds. So for us, this study belongs to us. So for us, the target was class 1 HDEX, HDEX1, HDEX2, HDEX3, and HDEX8. Once we were very sure about that, yes, if we can inhibit, if we can inhibit this enzyme, the isoforms of this enzyme, you know, we can surely have a potent anti-breast cancer compound in hand or an anti-gastric cancer compound in hand. So with this clear-cut vision, we moved ahead and then the other target, you know, I'll be discussing, uh, I'll be discussing two examples. So the other target which, which, which we selected for, for our research was HDEC6. Again, this is an isoform of HDEC, the same enzyme, but this enzyme has been found to be overexpressed in colon cancer and also brain tumors, glioblastoma. So if someone who is connected right now and they are looking to work in the area of neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, glioblastoma, then this is also a uh, target of their choice. The best thing is, you know, why I'm talking about the inhibition of isoforms, you know, why not pan HDEC inhibitors, an inhibitor that can inhibit all the isoforms. You know, usually it is believed and it has been evidence that if we can selectively approach an isoform, Suppose HDEC has many isoforms and if we can selectively inhibit HDEC6, then usually toxicity issues have not been observed uh, with these kind of inhibitors. That means selectivity attenuates the toxicity. This is a thumb rule in medicinal chemistry. So we actually believe in this. We always look to synthesize selective isoform inhibitors. So first, there were two targets which we selected for our study. One was the class 1 HDEC inhibitors that include HDEC1, HDEC2, 3, uh, and 8 isoform. And the second one was HDEC6 uh, as a target. Once, once you are clear about the target, very, very clear about the target, then you need to choose a molecule, a structure. Because what I'm talking about is, I'm not talking about 
novel drug design. I am talking about the drugs which are already there, but they were unfortunate that they could not be, they could not uh, advance to the clinical level. So we have to select. Once we are very sure about the targets that yes, I want to work on this target, I want to work on this target. Then the next step is choose a structure, structure so that you can employ the structural engineering attempts on that. So these are the two structures which we selected. This is MS275. This is a structure which is a class 1 H -tech inhibitor. And this is a second structure that is tuberstatin, that is a H -tech 6 inhibitor. So we, after selecting the targets, we selected the molecules and then thought that we will do our structural engineering, we will do structural alteration, we will do structural modifications on these scaffolds. Now, there has to be a reason, a very solid reason, a very valid reason. Why to modify this structure? You know, if the structure is so accomplished, is so promising, is so uh, uh, beneficial for some kind of activity, then why to change it? You know, structural modification is about changing the structure in a very, very subtle way. So why to change these structures? You know? So there has to be a story, there has to be a valid reason. So let me tell you, just look at the first structure, why we did the structural engineering of this compound is this structure named MS275 is a very potent class 1 h -like inhibitor, very, very potent. But unfortunately, it has not become, it has not uh, translated into a drug. So it has been confined to preclinical studies and even some clinical studies, but has not been approved. So there must be some reasons. There must be some drawbacks, some shortcomings of this compound. So when I first saw this compound, you know, I was very clear that this molecule appears to be very, very flexible, very flexible. If you just see, this part is very flexible. And the second thing which was like intriguing for me was this carbamate bond looks to be very metabolically labile. And when I started reading about MS275, I came to know that yes, formation of toxic metabolites has been a very prominent issue with this structure that has actually hurdled the clinical growth of this compound, hindered rather. So I thought, let us work on this compound. You know, the template is there, the structure is already there. If I can just make sure that these shortcomings are attenuated, then surely we can have something in hand which can be very promising, very potent and free form from the toxicity issues. So this is the vision, this is the conceivement that let us work on this molecule. I told you the carbamate bond and the molecular flexibility. So that is very clear. We, we wanted to remove this carbamate bond so that the molecule, the metabolic liability is not an issue and we want to reduce the flexibility. So we'll, we plan to do some uh, modifications to induce rigidity in the structure. The second structure is the structure of tuber strategy a very, very wonder compound, a very potent h 6 inhibitor, very, very potent h 6 inhibitor. Unfortunately, and intriguingly, you know, despite showing such an activity, such a promising activity, this compound was found to be devoid of anti-cancer compounds. And this was like, I was astonished when I first read about this molecule, I was flabbergasted. I had no idea why, despite uh, being able to inhibit h 6 uh, isoform at a very low concentration, why this compound is not showing uh, anti-cancer effects? Because HDX6 isoform has been found to be overexpressed in so many malignancies, so many malignancies. So I thought there must be something in this molecule that needs to be changed. Because I work in the area of anti-cancer drug design and I wanted to utilize the promising, the striking, the magnificent HDX6 inhibitory potential of this compound to extract anti-cancer effects. So I wanted to activate this compound. Of course, enzymatic inhibition is good. You know, we want the compound to be very potent enzymatic inhibitor, but our ultimate aim is to extract some bioactivity through that enzymatic inhibition. You know, if that compound is just an enzyme inhibitor and is not showing the desired bioactivity, then, then it is of no use. So we wanted to make sure that this magnificent HDX6 inhibitory profile of this compound is utilized, is amplified, is actually this compound needs to be activated so that acting through HDX6 inhibition, it can show some very promising anti-cancer activity. So this was the vision. 
this was the vision which actually spurred us to select these compounds let us work on ms275 which appears to be very very metabolic molecular uh, flexible and metabolically labile and tuber statin which is a small molecule this part appears to be very rigid so we thought let us just try a approach confer some degrees of rigidity to ms275 and confer some degrees of flexibility to this part of tuber statin so this in this part i will be discussing that how we chose two structure we selected two structures and then just doing did some subtle structural variations to make sure that the activity is amplified the toxicity is reduced this was the vision the first the first approach the structural engineering attempts on ms275 a very potent class 1 hdac inhibitor very potent anti cancer compound also so the enzymatic and cellular activity was not a problem was never an issue with ms275 but the issue was it has not been able to advance to the clinical from the clinically to the clinical studies to the approval levels so we need to do something to make sure that it or a structural analog or clone of this compound becomes an fda approved drug so we thought i just told you that this carbamate carbamate functionality was an issue and then we wanted to induce some rigidity so we thought let us just cleave this part of course through a chemical approach you know you can design as many compounds on a paper but ultimately you have to formulate a synthetic route for the synthesis so through a chemical approach we wanted to remove this and then we wanted to stitch this nitrogen from this side to this side which can be done by casement of a bicyclic ring now a placement of biocyclic ring automatically confers some degree of rigidity to the compound so we thought this is the best way to actually make this structure a bit rigidified and also which is also accompanied by the removal of this carbonate so we thought this should be proceeded like this and then you know obviously as a medicinal chemist every chemist every pharmacologist who is connected with me at the moment i'll just let you know that one is designing papers is on designing compounds on papers is very very easy but designing and but synthesizing them in the lab is actually a very very challenging thing and then you know as a medicinal chemist i'm not looking to synthesize one drug never because one drug is never going to serve my purpose i'm going i'm looking for a library of compounds so that i can pinpoint some compounds out, out of the library that show good enzymatic activity good cellular activity so for that i need to build a library for the library i need to synthesize so many molecules so i need to choose various point of modifications like x y r so that i can place some substituents at x substituents at y substituents at, at r and in doing so i can accomplish a library of compounds you know i belong to the old school of thought i feel more the number of molecules the chances of me pinpointing a more potent compound will be amplified so this is this is what i feel you know although you know if someone is working with a computational chemist then you don't need to synthesize so many compounds because if we are computational chemist is an integral part of the team then you know you can just filter down using the protein data bank docking study then you can just select only the few compounds that you need to synthesize but we have been doing this without the computational expert it doesn't mean that we don't have a computational expert in our team but we belong to the old school of thought you know we just use our head to design drugs and once those drugs are designed we move towards the synthesis so this is what we follow but you know the approach is flexible if someone is looking to synthesize very few molecules only 4 and 5 then they need to invest more time in the computational studies do the docking studies do the study go through the protein data bank study the active site of the uh, enzyme and then design drugs so it's up to you it's a very very flexible approach every person has a particular inclination towards the or towards a particular way i told you we design the drugs and then we just check the activity and later on we do the computational studies but someone are doing the computational studies at at the very first stage when they are very clear about the target so i was talking that the library has to be generated because i need to pin pair pin point one compound and i need to establish a structure activity relationship so this was done this is a synthesis i'm not sure if someone is interested uh, in listening how we synthesize these drugs but of course these are multi step synthetic protocols 
and uh, let me tell you you know we are pharmaceutical chemists we are medicinal chemists but we cannot escape from organic chemistry you know a lot of students they join my group and then they they share their views about chemistry that they are very much interested in medicinal chemistry but they are not looking to work in the area of organic chemistry but that is like an impossible thing if you are not we are not having a strong hold in the area of organic chemistry you cannot synthesize drugs medicinal chemistry the very first step is organic chemistry so we need to be very very strong very very strong as far as organic chemistry concepts are concerned and we need to have a very good command on those concepts and then we need to implement those uh, concepts in the multi step synthetic protocols and that is the way how we synthesize drugs so you need to have a very strong knowledge of organic chemistry and of course your your concepts the retro synthetic analysis that ability needs to be very strong because once you design the drug in your head that has to be synthesized in the lab so you need to know that how what what reactants are required to be used for the synthesis of a complex structure that was designed by your head so one needs to be very very strong in retro synthetic analysis organic chemistry uh, in if you talk about the organic chemistry every concept that nucleophilic substitutions electrophilic substitutions all named reactions uh, organometallic chemistry the suzuki coupling hack alternation bukwal lamination ester hydrolysis amination protic acid cleavages base uh, mediated cleavages one needs to be very very well versed um, as far as organic chemistry is concerned otherwise there is no way you can synthesize those drugs so i have not discussed the synthesis just just uh, thinking that not everyone is interested in knowing how we did this from a to this from what we used in this step and then how but these are multi step synthetic rules and this was uh, done by us to accomplish the library of compounds that were designed by us yes so once we design the compounds then synthesize them then usually we proceed first with the in vitro cytotoxicity assays so you now i told you we designed these compounds uh, for breast cancer and gastric cancer so what we did is we evaluated all the compounds against the breast cancer cell lines and the gastric cancer cell lines. so if you just see you know these are the three breast cancer cell lines mba mb231 mba mb468 and mcf7 now this is a compound this is a compound that was designed by us and synthesized by us if you just look at this graph you can easily figure out that the ic50 of compound 14 is lower than ms275 now this is an indication that the lead modification is going in the right direction it is going in the right direction because the lead was ms275 though our aim was to reduce the flexibility of the compound but in doing so we could also identify a compound which was more potent anti cancer compound uh, than the ms275 so we modified our lead and had something in hand which was more potent than the lead so this was like game we were like going great guns in this context and if you just see it was more potent inhibitor against the breast cancer cell lines than the ms275 and even the chidamide chidamide is another structurally related compound a class 1 hdac inhibitor that was approved by Uh, the FDA, but not the US FDA, the Chinese FDA. Now, if you just see in this in this cell line, MD MD two three one, the compound forty was more active than MS two seven five and cytomide. If you just go towards this, the other cancer cell line, breast cancer cell line, MD A MD four six eight. Again, the compound forty is more potent than the both the standards. But when you consider the results against MS. MCF7 that is again a breast cancer cell line but it is with estrogen receptors and these two uh, breast cancer cell lines they are like triple negative breast cancer cell lines so if you just consider the results of uh, the compound against MCF cell line and compare it with the previous two cell lines you we'll figure out that compound 14 was not as active as the standard as the lead compound even in this cell line the ms275 was more active so it was very clear cut that against mcf7 cell, uh, cell line the results were not very very promising because the lead compound was more potent it has a uh, lower ic50 value but that is also you know that was also a very optimistic finding and i tell you why 
because we have drugs that act against MCF7 cell lines. But usually, these cell lines, which are triple negative breast cancer cell lines, they do not respond to targeted therapy. So that means this is something very useful. This finding was very, very useful. And we can get something in hand. We, have, we actually identified a compound that showed very good activity against the triple negative breast cancer cell line. So this was very optimistic finding. And then we checked the compound against the breast, against the gastric cancer cell line. Now you just see the two cell lines were, uh, were employed. One is YCC11 and YCC37. The difference between the two cell lines is one is an HDAC inhibitory sensitive, inhibitor sensitive cell line and one is the resistant cell line. Now, if you just look at the activity profile of compound 14, the compound 14 was active against the gastric cancer cell line, HDAC inhibitor sensitive, as well as HDAC inhibitor resistant cell line. You know, this, this means that the compound and there was no significant difference in the activity of the compound 14 against these two cell lines. That means the resistance is not an issue with this compound, HDAC inhibitor sensitive cell line as well as HDAC inhibitor resistant cell lines. Against both the cell lines, it was almost equipotent. But if you consider the activity of MS275, it was active against the sensitive cell line. But when it comes to the resistant cell lines, it was almost two folds less potent in comparison to what it had uh, shown uh, against the HDAC inhibitor sensitive cell line. So it was very clear cut uh, that uh, against the resistant cell lines, MS275 was not active. So that was again a very optimistic and a promising finding that we have an inhibitor that can actually overcome the resistance issue in the HDAC inhibitor resistance issue in gastric cancer cell. So with these promising effects, we went, we moved further from the cellular assays towards the enzymatic assays. You know, this is another important area of drug design. You know, the first step I told you, if someone is designing drugs, they have to select a target. Once they select a target, they have to design a drug. Once they design the drug, then they have to synthesize the drugs. Then they have to move towards the cellular activity. However, this uh, protocol is flexible for every research group. Some, they do the enzymatic activity first. Some of as they we do the cellular activity first, but I'm talking from my perspective and my experience, we do the cellular assays first. So it becomes very, very important and mandatory for us to make sure that these cellular effects have been mediated through the HDAC inhibition because that was the target. That was the target that we selected in the very beginning, in the initial stages of our drug design. So we checked the compound for its, its uh, HDAC inhibitory potential and figured out that our compound was a very potent HDAC inhibitor, very, very potent HDAC inhibitor. If you just see the activity against HDAC1 isoform and compare it with the lead compound, our compound was five times more potent than HDAC, uh, than MS275. So it was like, yes, we could, we did the lead modification. We did the lead modification and we could get something which is more potent anti-cancer compound, which is more potent enzymatic inhibitor than compound 40. And we were like overwhelmed to see these results. And then this, we performed the Western blot analysis just to make sure the uh, validate the enzymatic inhibitory potential of the compound. And we found that compound 40, it could elevate the acetylation levels of histone acetyl, uh, histone H3. You can just see at 0 0.5 micromolar to five, it is under, uh, inducing the upregulation of the uh, acetylation level of histone H3. So it was, it is like a signatory biomarker feature of uh, HDAC inhibitors. And we were very sure that our compound was mediating its anti-cancer effects through HDAC inhibition. So with this vision, we move further. Now, this is the computational studies. I was just discussing a few minutes back that, you know, you can be very, very flexible in your approach, very flexible in your approach. Now, one can uh, do the computational studies first in the very first phase of their drug design or their endeavor, or they can do it like us. What we do is we design the drugs just on the basis of the structure, existing structure activity relationships, design them, synthesize them, evaluate them. And then we do the computational studies just to rationalize the experimental results with the computational study. Means we know that compound 14 is a very potent anti-cancer compound. 
we know that compound 14 is a very very potent enzymatic inhibitor now we just want to know that what is the reason why it is showing such kind of a magnificent enzymatic uh, profile what is the reason what are the groups responsible for that of course this study is not going to do uh, help us now in this study because the computational study is not going to do any good. The reason is because we have already identified a potent compound. But this computational study can be of great help for us when if we want to continue working on these kind of inhibitors. Because we would be figuring out the key interactions that are responsible for some very potent HDAC inhibition. And then if we want to synthesize more HDAC class 1 inhibitors in the future, then we can just use this existing information. And using this information, uh, we can just proceed forward and make more and more inhibitors and just load the armory of HDAC inhibitors. So this is this is the reason why we do it after figuring out, after identifying, after pinpointing a compound. So of course, this compound was dropped uh, in HDAC1 isoform in the active site of HDAC1, isoform HDAC2, isoform HDAC3, isoform some hydrogen bonding interactions were observed, some, hydro, uh, some hydrophobic interactions were observed, zinc binding chelation was observed. So we were very sure, okay, now if I want to work on these kind of uh, inhibitors, I need to place these, these groups, and this is a way how we can modify this, making sure that these interactions are kept intact. So this is, this is the fun of doing this after the experimental results, because you, know, you feel a lot more confident when you have the experimental results in hand. Those computational studies, they are still, I mean, you know, they are like indicative or supporting study. That this is what I believe. So this is a way how we do it. And moving further, there is no, no alternative. You, know, you have to do the in vivo study. If you have a, um, a pharmacologist in your group, you have to uh, see whether the in vitro efficacy is being translated into in vivo efficacy. That is very, very important. And we checked the anti-tumor efficacy of compound 14 in this breast cancer xenograft model. And we found that compound 14 could actually uh, suppress the tumor growth. You know, it had tumor growth inhibitory potential. Just look at this. At uh, 25 milligrams, it could inhibit with a TGI of 32.5. And at 50 milligrams per kg, it could inhibit the tumor growth at 56.3% uh, tumor growth inhibition. So, this was like very, very promising effects. We designed, we did a lead modification. And although we did a lead modification to reduce its metabolic uh, liability, metabolic liability and uh, flexibility, but in the process, we could find a compound which was more potent, which is more potent than the lead compound. And now this compound was uh, has been submitted to, the, to our expert who works in the area of uh, this pharmacokinetic characterization and uh, we just gave, got the information from him this, that the formation of toxic metabolites is not a problem with compound form. So this is like a complete study. You know, we, we selected a compound, modified it using our knowledge of medicinal chemistry, using our knowledge of drug design. And once we did that, you know, what we found was like very good. We found a compound which is more potent then lead compound in every sense, in every context, enzymatic, cellular, in vivo, everything. And not only that, the latest information on this compound is that it is a very, very uh, stable compound, metabolically. So that means toxicity issues have been dealt, activity has been amplified, so what more you can do. And what we did is, we did a very, very small modification. We just, we did not change the template, we just induced some rigidity. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, by doing so, you know, you can have a drug in hand in an expedited way rather than starting from scratch. And of course, if you are working on well-established targets, then there is no point of, you know, wasting the information or just uh, wasting the efforts of others. You know, we can just learn, okay, this guy has reported this. We can just start from where he left. You know, that is perfectly fine. This is an era of applied science. Medicinal chemistry is all about applied chemistry. So, so this is perfectly fine. So this is a way, you know, I was, when I, I'll just like to share if someone uh, is willing to know that when I started my research career, I worked with an organic chemist. He 
uh, Professor K.L. Dhar and I learned everything from him and he is like a pioneer in the field of natural product and his par excellence. And we started our research in like a very basic research, chemistry research, organic chemistry, which is of course more challenging from a chemistry point of view. But then, you know, I feel if someone has a strong hold in organic chemistry, then they can actually be very, poor, very, very uh, useful medicinal chemist, I would say, because their chemistry part is very strong. So they can just learn something about drug design and leverage that knowledge gained in the area of uh, organic chemists to design new drugs. So this is one of the study. And I told you in the beginning that I, we, we selected two structures for our studies. So one was the one MS275, which I just discussed. And now this is the second part. In the first part, we made sure that the structure becomes rigid. In the second part, we, are, we will be, I'll be showing how we made sure that the structure is not rigid. Structure becomes flexible. So it, it is like two contrasting methodologies adopted for two different scaffolds. Just look at this. I'll just recall you, help you recall what I told about this structure. This is a structure of Cuba statin. I told you this is a very, very potent HDX6 inhibitor. Very potent. But unfortunately, despite being such a potent HDX6 inhibitor, it has not been able to demonstrate anti-cancer effects. And this is very intriguing because HDX6 isoform has been found to be overexpressed in so many malignancies in brain tumor also. So what, what could be the reason that is actually hindering this compound? There must be some, some reasons, some structural features that are proving to be a hurdle that it, despite being a very potent inhibitor, enzymatic, it is not showing cellular effects. So we, we took it as a challenge. Okay, we will activate this compound, which is just an enzyme inhibitor. We will activate its structure towards cellular effects also, keeping, in, keeping intact the uh, enzymatic inhibition. So we thought, let us modify this compound. Let us structurally engineer this compound. Let us do some structural alterations. Let us embellish this compound in a way that we can get something very useful from the medicinal chemistry point of view. If you just see, we thought this part labeled as ABC, this tricyclic ring, this is very, very rigid. So we thought, let us just open the ring. Let us see if this part may, is flexible, what impact it has on the bioactivity. So we made sure that the ring gets open. And after opening the ring, you know, you just see, we opened it in three different ways. Ring opening, where just this was clean. Another ring opening strategy, where an SP2 hybridized carbon was placed. And another ring opening strategy, where this methyl was placed, just to mimic, exactly mimic the ring C of this scaffold, the tuber statin. But as I told you, as a medicinal chemist, we are always looking to establish structure activity relationship. We are always looking to see how subtle structural variations can affect the activity. We are always looking to evidence the impact of structural alteration on the bioactivity. So for that, we need to synthesize more and more compounds. So what we did is we thought, let us not just confine towards the structural modification of this part, let us modify the green part also. And what we did is this, we labeled it as A and we placed various, various, various uh, fragments, linkers over here. Just see, A was this, then we place B, C, and D. And these three caps and these four linkers, using diverse permutations and combinations, we could actually establish a library of compounds. And once the library of compounds was designed, till now we, have, we only designed, now we have to synthesize them. So I told you again, the knowledge of organic chemistry, multi-step synthetic roots, very, very basic organic chemistry. We need to make sure that these compounds are not just synthesized. We need to make sure that they have been synthesized in very good ways. Because if you want to proceed towards the in vivo studies, pharmacokinetic studies, you are not looking at 3 milligram or 5 milligram or 10 milligram or 20 milligram of compounds. You have to synthesize it in gram scales. So if you want to do something big, you need to make sure that adequate efforts are invested in this part so that you can have a compound in good amount. Otherwise, there is no way that the compound can proceed towards the clinical study. So this is a very important part. So a very, very efficient, able chemist is 
uh, needs to be in that way. You know, if someone is just good at drug designing, then they have to make sure that they involve an organic chemistry in, uh, or chemist in that way. And if someone is a good is good at drug design, good at organic chemistry, then you know he is like he can be very successful in this field because he won't be dependent on anyone for this part. So this is I'm not uh, discussing this. But if someone is interested, they can contact me uh, through emails or something like that through any uh, connectivity platform and we can discuss about this. So once the compounds were designed, the compounds were synthesized. So half of the work is done, but the most important part, because we are talking about drugs which have some activity. So the biological evaluation part becomes very, very imperative, very imperative. So, <clears throat> This is just to show you the compounds were evaluated against colorectal cancer cell lines. The compounds which were synthesized, they were evaluated against colorectal cancer cell lines. And you can just see, I'll just make things easier for you. Yeah. Yes. You know, if you just see, this is the structure of pubostatin. This is the compound. This compound was not active against the col colorectal cancer cell line. But when we change the linker, this part, when A was changed to B and B, you know, it got activated. Just see, compound number five is active, compound number six is active. Again, if you see the combination of CAT1 with the fragment A, compound seven, again, it is not active against the colorectal cancer cell line. But a combination of CAT1 with fragment B, C, and D, all of them were active. All of them were active. They were showing good efficacy against the colorectal cancer cell lines. So it was very clear that, you know, this linker is the culprit. The linker, you know, see in our, uh, our quest or our journey to modify this compound, pubostatin, we could figure out the reason that what actually is hindering this compound to demonstrate, to manifest or to elicit good activity, cellular activity. And this, this fragment, the fragment A was the culprit. Whichever compound had fragment A in their chemical architecture, that compound was unable to depict cellular effects. Whereas just the replacement of this compound, this fragment, could activate the compound towards potent anti-colorectal cancer effects. So this was like, we were very overwhelmed to observe this because this was a consistent feature observed in all the compounds. Even if you just look at this slide, again, compound 15, if you just see the structure of compound 15, again, this part is a part, this fragment is a part of compound 15, no activity. But as soon as it goes to BC, the compound gets activated towards the anti-colorectal cancer. So we were very sure that if we want to utilize the chemical architecture of tuba statin to show, to make sure that it demonstrates some cellular effects, we need to make sure that A is not a part of that. A is not a part of the structure. So we, we, we actually got good structural insights and then we move further. I'm not discussing this because I just summarized what we observed. And then, you know, what we did is we picked five compounds, which were like potent anti-cancer compounds against the colorectal cancer cell lines, and then evaluated it through the colony formation assay. These are the assays. You know, usually you don't stop at the cell in vitro cytotoxicity assay only. You make sure that you perform more and more and more assays just to validate the anti-cancer efficacy. So this was another assay. We picked five compounds which showed very good uh, uh, results in the cytotoxicity assay. And then we checked them for their colony formation ability. And we, we came to know that these compounds, they suppress the colony formation. Just see, as the concentration is increasing, 0 0.6 micromolar, 1.25, 2.55, they could suppress the colony formation. So it was very clear that these compounds have some anti-cancer effects. And then uh, they were evaluated by Western blot analysis. So this was the first indication that, yes, these compounds are exerting cellular effects. And those effects are mediated through h -tech inhibition. You just see compound number 8, 9, 12, 13, 18, they were designed by us. They are new, they were new, they are new compounds. And all of them, they could result, they could cause the upregulation of acetyl tubular. They could uh, result in upregulation of acetyltibulin. You just see the upregulation pattern of acetyltibulin. Now, this is a characteristic biomarker uh, feature, signatory biomarker feature of uh, HDX6 inhibitors. So, this gave us an idea that yes, we have been able to activate the compound. 
we have been able to activate the compound towards uh, cellular effects and those effects are still being mediated through h 6 inhibition. So we were very, very motivated by these results. And then, you know, of course, we designed h inhibitors. So we need to make sure that they are h inhibitors, that too, the h 6 inhibitors. So <clears throat> what we did is, we, uh, we evaluated the compounds against various isoforms, h 1 h 2 h 6 h and this is the selectivity. And we, we could see that, you, know, you just see, in this table, we have presented the compounds which, will, which we are all the same linker. A-type linker, A-type linker, A-type linker, A-type linker, but different cap constructs, different cap constructs, different cap constructs. And we were very clear that a-type linker, presence of A-type linker with any of the cap will lead to very potent h 6 inhibitory effect. Just see, compound 7, 6.17 nanomolar. This concentration, at this concentration, where it was inhibiting h 6 This is the IC50 value. If you just compare its results with compound number 3, tubastatin, you know, compound number 3 was not as potent as that. So, one of the findings was this. Though the compound number 7, 11, and 15, they were not potent anti-cancer compounds, but we have also identified more potent h 6 inhibitors than tubastatin. So this, this study actually had various layers of results. One result is we, could, we were able to find h inhibitors, h 6 inhibitors that were just h 6 inhibitors, but more potent than tubastatin. Though they were not showing any anti-cancer effects, but they are more potent than tibastatin. Then we move towards the second lot. Move towards the second lot and in this, you can see different cap constructs and a particular type of linker. Now, if you just see, removing that linker, the linker of tibastatin, of course, there was a dip in h 6 inhibitory profile, a significant dip. But the benefit with these compounds is they were anti-cancer compounds. Now, the other thing is, though there was a dip in activity, but still 84 nanomolar is not that bad activity. So it was very clear that we these compounds are mediating their effects through h 6 inhibition. We moved further. These are other compounds. You can just see 6, 9, 13. These are the compound codes. And they had this, this kind of a linker. And you can just see h 6 inhibition was maintained, though they were not as active as tubastatin. Compound number 10, compound number 14, and compound number 18, all with the same type of a linker, uh, different cap construct. Now you can just see, I'll just discuss about compound number 17. Now compound number 17, if we talk about h 6 inhibition, it is very potent. More potent than 3, which was the lead structure in this compound. and to the uh, it was a matter of delight to see that compound 17 was also a very potent anti cancer compound. So, you know, I just told you this study, it was like it actually gave us everything. It gave us a more potent enzymatic inhibitor than tubastatin. It gave us a compound, it gave us a, several compounds which were like balanced compounds. Balanced, they demonstrated a balanced cellular effects, balanced enzymatic activity. And then we found this compound, which was like a more potent enzymatic inhibitor than tubastatin, as well as a far more potent anti-cancer compound. So, you know, the aim was accomplished. We could find, we, we could actually pinpoint what we were designing to. So this study, I, would, I, I rate this study is a highly successful one by our research group. So this is a summary. You know, let me just summarize you so that you can recall things. Yeah, I think I should discuss this rather. You know, we we actually started, commenced or embarked on two structural endeavors, two chemistry endeavors. In one of the endeavor, we made sure that the structure is rigidified. In another endeavor, we made sure that the structure is made flexible. Two contrasting methodologies, two contrasting strategies, but the result was overlapping. Overlapping means both the strategies let us identify compounds which were far more accomplished inhibitors than the lead compound. So, you know, this is what I wanted to present that, you know, sometimes you know, we just take a structure, do some structural, structural variations. And by doing this, by doing this, you know, we can actually arrive at something which is much more, much more potent, much more promising 
than the lead compounds. So this is this is this was the conclusion of these two parts. Now I wanted to discuss more with you about what concept, what about the concept of multi-targeting agents. We actually are working on multi-targeting agents very extensively at the moment, which has actually, of course, it is very uh, beneficial to work on multi-targeting agents. The best thing is multi-targeting agents. You know what we mean to say is an agent which is which can interact with more than one target that becomes a multi-targeting agent. More precisely and specifically, they are dual inhibitor. That means they can interact with two targets. The best thing about this is multi-target. The concept of multi-targeting agents and dual inhibitors. They, this concept was like out and out rejected around two decades back because they thought that these kind of inhibitors are very promiscuous. And since they can interact with so many targets, toxicity is an issue with them. But now this has been like this concept has been accepted with open arms, and every medicinal chemist is working on multi-targeting agents. So if someone is interested in discussing about multi-targeting agents and knowing about multi-targeting agents and learning how to design a multi-targeting agent, then they can be in touch with me. I'll be more than happy to help them in this context. Protax, you know, I earlier also delivered a lecture uh, with the same team, and I told you, you know. Protax. Now we don't have the time, but I'll just uh, brief up. Protax is a degrader, so you know now the concept is like uh, undergoing a transposition from inhibitor to degrader. The degraders, uh, because these Protax, uh, they are like very potent and they usually have a catalytic mode of action. So usually, very small concentration is required to uh, exert the anti-cancer effect. So. Uh, this is a concept which is very different from inhibitor. But the best thing is, if someone is looking to design this, um, uh, this uh, uh, capitalize on this uh, concept, then they don't need to start from scratch because the Protac model. If you just look at the definition, proteolysis targeted chimeras. They are vitro functional small molecules with three chemical elements. So they basically. Include a ligand to a target protein, a ligand to E3 ubiquitin ligase, and a linker for conjugated uh, these two ligands. So basically, we have a library of inhibitors for every every protein. You know, every journal is flooded. Even the industry, their synthetic blend is flooded with so many inhibitors. Using those inhibitors, we can create degraders. This is the best part of this. Let me tell you the very practical thing. Using those inhibitors. We can place them in this template, link it with a ligand for UP, uh, E3 ubiquitin uh, ligase, and then construct a degrader. So this is a very very promising emerging approach, which is uh, which I think is going to be a future in medicinal chemistry. Already, every group has started working in uh, this field, and if someone is interested in knowing about this, of course, we can discuss at length about this. This was about Protax. and this is like what we do you know what we are actually doing and what strategies we are following in our lab you know i told you we are working in the area of uh, anti cancer drug design so these are some of the hurdles you know which we have faced and we are constantly striving hard to make sure that these issues can be resolved drug resistance this is um, uh, irrespective of the target we are working on i'm just presenting it in a very very generalized view that what hurdles we face when we are working in this field in the uh, field of small molecule anti cancer agents first is we make so many drugs so many drugs they show good preliminary activity but ultimately when we go towards the check their activity against the resistant cancer cell line then some of them they are not as potent as we would have liked them to be so drug resistance has been an issue that we have been uh, facing cancer sense uh, stem cells if there is a biotechnology Uh, technologists with us they can they will be very well versed with the concept of cancer stem cells so let me just brief up this is also a very significant factor for conferring resistance to the cancer cells and because the cancer cells you know they are very notorious and once they develop resistance to the cytotoxic agents then your cytotoxic agent is of no use then because we are working in the area of uh, brain tumors glioblastoma so we synthesize a lot of drugs which show very good activity in the preliminary stages but ultimately 
blood brain barrier permeability has been an issue so we have been now uh, employing a very logical approach to design drugs for the brain lack of efficacious and selective agents i would say that healthy cells normal cells versus cancer cells so we basically every team they find it easy to synthesize cytotoxic agents but to have a anti cancer compounds means they should have selectivity towards uh, the cancer cells not the uh, they should not be that active against the normal cells so this is what we feel that sometimes we just end up making cytotoxic agents but we have to have the compounds which do not have any activity against the normal cells and mutations is another and drug target is another hurdle and what strategies we have been employing to overcome these hurdles are we are like targeting various various uh, uh, isoforms of the enzymes like we are synthesizing tubulin inhibitors kinase hdac tarp hsp ezh2 so these are the targets that we have been leveraging for the design of anti cancer compounds isoform selectivity i told you you know a pan inhibitor is always toxic most of the times not always but most of the times but if you can make sure that a compound can exhibit selectivity towards a particular isoform of an enzyme then uh, the toxicity is not that much an issue so we are now looking to synthesize only isoform selectivity lead modifications of course i discussed with you how we have been modifying the leads concomitant balanced inhibition of multiple targets so we are designing dual inhibitor and protein target degradation is we have started working in the area of protax so for a medicinal chemist i would say that if someone is just looking to kick start his career they can work on tubulin and hdac inhibition because the structural template for these inhibitors they are very very well established this is this is what actually we do sometimes most of the times but this part is flexible in our approach like for the designing of the drugs the ideal the way is you know you move you go through the protein data bank select the active site of an enzyme then you design drugs and use the molecular docking to just see whether the design drugs they are able to fit in that binding chemistry once you are done with this then you move towards the organic chemistry organic chemistry means you need to find a way how to synthesize those drugs for this you know sometimes you move towards the natural product chemistry in context of lead identification either you synthesize new drugs or you just find drugs that are able to fit well in the active site and you turn up to natural products and do some lead modifications in the structural templates of those phytoconstituents once you are once you are done with the synthesis part of course chromatography is a very very important part Uh, purification of the compounds because we want the compounds in good purity more than 95% structural elucidation so this is all going on in one direction in this direction that we synthesize them uh, purify them then we elucidate the structures and once we are done and confirmed about the structures then we move towards the biological evaluation we do the assays cellular assays and zymatic assays and then um, develop and establish a structural activity so this is a very very a brief overview which uh, what we do and i would be more than happy to discuss any anything and everything with anyone who is interested in having a in depth discussion about any concept in medicinal chemistry which i am well versed in i'll uh, like to discuss with them uh, to the best of my capabilities so this was all about today's lecture and i am open to all the questions because of the time constraint i could not discuss everything that i actually planned to but yes it was it's actually an honor to be connected with so many so many professionals i'm sure some of the people connected at the moment they must be my seniors and uh, i'm extremely thankful to each and every person who uh, who actually demonstrated resilience in listening to me thank you very much thank you so much sir for such a wonderful and nice informative session maybe participants are wonderful learning opportunity for this presentation and maybe very well explained sir thank you so much sir for giving your thank time you. for in busy schedule nice. if oh, any participants you. any question you can ask participants if any question you can ask
I feel there is no question. You know, Sunday, oh, no yes, one was sir. willing to <laughs> listen to me. You know, Sunday uh-huh. can be lectures on Sundays can be very boring. I feel the same. No, sir, but <laughs> you, uh, your lecture is very interesting because you were very expand on the chemistry end. But participants are uh, comment section is very oh, good session Thank and you. wonderful session also. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. So okay, sir. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Ashwini Dingra, HOD of the department, for vote of thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Guru Gobind Singh College of Pharmacy, with due respect, I, Ashwini Dingra, would like to extend my heartful gratitude to our esteemed speaker for sharing his valuable knowledge. Uh, in the field of drug designing and discovery. I appreciate your knowledge, commitment, and passion for conducting the research in terms of anti-cancer compounds. Your expert talk has provided a brief overview about the Aztec inhibitors as an anti-cancer compounds and various other areas which need to be explored. And uh, we hope that uh, one day you came with some new molecule. We hope that your corporation will remain to continue with us in the future. And your kind presence and expert talk in this program, encouraging us a lot for selecting the methodology while considering the drug designing and discovery. Thank you, Kunal. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini. Thank you for providing me this opportunity to be connected uh, with all you, with all of you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now, as a token of respect and appreciation on the behalf of Guru Gobind Singh College of Pharmacy, I would present a certificate, sir. It's on the screen, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Actually, I'm unable to see that. It's fine. <laughs> Okay. It's okay. Thank you so much for the certificate. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, Lord. So, am I allowed to leave now? Yes, sir. You are please. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thanks to all the participants. Tomorrow again, you will join again for validatory section. Tomorrow is our validatory session. Session will be start at 10 a.m. Okay, thanks.